I'm Shen Cheng Hu, Academia Sinica. Uh, welcome to the fourth plenary session. Uh, this session is in honor of Pro Professor Gregory Chow of the Princeton University. So I will say a few words about him, and I will give podium to our speaker, uh, Bob Thompson of MIT. Uh, Gregory was recently honored by the American Economic Association is a distinguished fellow. Okay. He richly uh, deserved the honor. I think we all know of his contribution to the econometrics theory, so I would not say further. But he also contributed greatly to the economic development in this country. He joined other academicians particularly they read out here in advising the Chiang Kai-shek government, particularly to President Chiang Kai-shek himself. Under their advice, the government adopted reforms and openness policy and uh, had a new a modern tax system. And under this situation, the economy grew rapidly Subsequently, Professor Chow also went to China to advise the Chinese government. Particularly, he was quite a, uh, he had uh, some personal contact with uh, Premier Chao Ziyang. Okay. Under, his dealers, under his advice, and uh, China also adopted the openness parties. I think many, perhaps a few of you know, that uh, the first group of Chinese students studying in the U.S. was <coughs> under the sponsorship of the Ford Foundation and uh, the American Economics Association, simply because of his work. So he screened and recruited the best students from China to study in the U.S. That would be the first group of Chinese students uh, coming to the U.S. in the early 1980s. And uh, many of these students subsequently returned to their country, and uh, some joined the government, others became the distinguished economists. And uh, so, I think uh, Professor Chow greatly deserved the honor from the American Economic Association. I think he's also a fellow of the Economics Society. And our sp speaker today is uh, Bob Thompson. He's going to talk about the financial system design. And I give the podium to you, Professor Thompson. Thank you. Um, I also want to say a few words about Gregory Chow. And in part, this, uh, some of these will be themes of uh, the way I've organized the talk. Uh, so you certainly know of him through his well-known test. Uh, but more importantly, he had done research in micro, macro, and development, all three. And there was no, in his mind, no distinction across these fields as subfields. They were naturally unified. Uh, Professor Chow was estimating real business cycle models using the theory in the estimation. Uh, Manuel's talk this morning is another instance of, of that without making arbitrary assumptions about error terms. So it's dynamic optimization, maximum likelihood, combining theory and econometrics. And he did not shy away either from doing computational work, uh, numerical estimation of dynamic systems, including innovative algorithms. Uh, and then, as you could tell from the previous remarks, uh, he was very involved in China's written several books 
uh, who that used these techniques that he developed and was a, and a major policy advisor. Um, so, so I'm going to focus in that tradition on one country. It's not going to be China, but it will be Thailand. And uh, the topic is financial system design. Uh, let me, you know, give you sort of an outline, some guidance about how the talk is going to go, uh, so you can weave the pieces together as I go through it. But basically. We'll look at, uh, start at a, at a small community level, could be a town or a village, apply economic theory, devise the econometric tests, and uh, see how well the models uh, fit or don't, depending on the data, uh, and uh, devise alternative tests that are more general, allowing obstacles to trade, uh, and uh, then move out from the, the village or the town to the larger uh, region and, uh, and end up you know, with the whole country. So again, it's neither strictly micro nor strictly macro. It's both and they're integrated. Uh, and there's also a policy aspect. Financial system des design the bulk of the talk is positive economics to try to explain what is, it is that we're seeing, but uh, periodically I'll come back to an issue of a policy intervention or improved financial design based on the findings. Uh, now, uh, I do encourage you to, to ask questions. Um, worst comes to worst, you know, I'll leave time at the end, but Based on experience so far, people don't seem to want to execute that option. So if you look in front of you, you'll see these <coughs> microphones. And first of all, there's a voting mechanism. So uh, you can choose to exercise that. I have no idea. I have not pushed that button. Uh, if enough of you vote no, maybe I'll finish the talk early. Uh, but there is another little button at the bottom that says talk. And it's very hard to hear in this room if you don't have that microphone on. So maybe you'll be inspired. I would certainly enjoy being interrupted. It's much more spontaneous and often more productive to get, to get questions along the way. Um, so, oh, so about, you know, this slide, uh, one is where I've been collecting data under my own project for for quite a bit of time, and the other is a GIS map where we've mounted almost every other secondary database that we can, uh, that we can find and post. So you'll see me primarily focusing on my own data, but occasionally I'll be making reference to the location of branches of banks and so on that come from this other secondary database. Um, so my own data, I think I will not chew up too much time on this, started in 1997 with villages, uh, and we're currently at 17 years, and we are continuing uh, with a subset of the 192 uh, down to 64, but still doing it every year. And then we expanded to the north and the south beyond the four initial primary provinces. There's a monthly survey that began in 1998. We have 190 continuous months of panel data from that survey. And uh, of course, you can't ju do justice to the whole country if you're just in villages. So we have extended the sample to towns and urban areas, and in one case, you know, a major metropolitan uh, city. Uh, so the scale is roughly around 3,000 households a year, uh, but the variables and periodicity depends on the particular sample. So in particular with that monthly data, we asked enough questions to be able to create a complete set of financial accounts. Uh, so uh, that, by that I mean the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flow. 
uh, in a book which I'm very pleased to say, The Econometric Society, published with Sampan Tarak, um, and I'll be talking about these data. So to the theory, um, the idea is to determine the class of Pareto optimal allocations, and this can be done by maximizing a weighted sum of the discounted expected utilities of the households uh, in some unit. Now, you can think of this as a village programming problem, but in, it could be an extended network of kinship-related households. And in fact, you could solve this for the whole country if you wished. Um, but I will begin to think about it as a village. And uh, there's a resource constraint, of course, a trivial one in a way, that the sum of consumptions cannot add up to more than the aggregate. Uh, but that aggregate is determined by a larger resource constraint for a village. For example, it would be you know, the village level uh, budget um, constraint, uh, exports and imports, labor earnings, and so on. Um, from this subsystem, you can derive first order conditions that are pretty familiar by now. <clears throat> namely, equate weighted margin utilities uh, across all the households to some common uh, Lagrange multiplier, which is the shadow price on the, <clears throat> on the village resource constraint. Uh, and actually, you don't have to put in a lot of parametric structure into this problem. You're going to get implications that individual consumptions co-move with aggregate village consumption and controlling for that household specific idiosyncratic shocks actually shouldn't enter at all. And when you take this to, the, to each of 16 villages, um, I guess I would say still quite remarkably, you cannot reject the uh, exclusion hypothesis that idiosyncratic income should not enter. Only one of the 16 villages has a positive statistical coefficient on idiosyncratic shocks. So the point is that somehow this starting point abstract theory, as if everyone in the village were in some risk syndicate uh, co-sharing risks with one another, is a remarkably good benchmark uh, for for many of these villages. Um, now, that's just an example. You can extend the theory to include labor supply. Here on this slide, it's starting with a family that has individual members, maximizing a weighted sum of utilities of the members, uh, choosing how much each member is to work, consumption, and so on. So at the, again, at the household level, there's a budget constraint, which is like full income being the sum of non-labor income plus the valuation of the time endowments aggregated up over all the members equals you know, full expenditure, which is the value of consumption expenditures plus the value of leisure. Um, but again, it's more than just the family. The same technique works for all households in a village or larger units. You get from this theory, again, you know, basic work sharing and participation equations at the bottom of this slide. And it's much like the implication of consumption sharing. You know, work should co-move with aggregate work and controlling for that household-specific non-wage income should not enter the equation. Uh, and there is similarly an equation for the extensive margin, since not all members are working all the time uh, or run out of time, basically. Uh, so <clears throat> you, this is perhaps a bit more counterintuitive. You would think that labor supply is the main thing that a household would do when times are going badly, the crops are failing, they'll uh, respond by, you know, individually, one household at a time, by providing more labor. But no, it turns out that they're pooling those risks as well. Now, we will statistically reject this model, uh, but not by much. It's still a very useful benchmark. So the 
responses to a one standard deviation idiosyncratic shock uh, onto labor hours and onto participation are really uh, relatively small. Those things move, but they don't move much. Uh, now, let me take this little detour and think about, you know, the policy aspect of this. If, if villages are sharing risk this well, then, you know, is there any scope for intervention? Well, we're controlling for aggregate consumption. So if the village as a whole is subject to aggregate level shocks, that, that will move aggregate consumption, uh, which is then optimally shared in the population. But if something like rainfall uh, has a large aggregate component to it, then these villages as a whole could be vulnerable to rainfall shocks. And indeed, there are many interventions where the World Bank and country governments and NGOs uh, de design insurance products and market them to households. Uh, however, when there's heterogeneity in risk preferences, and the theory allows for that, then you can ac actually make some households worse off, even though this might seem to be a well-motivated uh, intervention. And the reason is, with, when risk preferences are different within a village, the relatively risk-averse households will be insured by the less risk-averse households and uh, be compensated, the insurers essentially are compensated by higher than average consumption. That's where they get their premium, so to speak. So if some outside agency comes in offering this insurance contract, you will undercut the provision of insurance by the least risk averse households in the village and, and they will be made worse off. And here on this slide, you're actually seeing uh, that in Sisaket Village 6 in particular, quite a few of the households are going to experience uh, welfare losses from this otherwise natural uh, policy. Um, so we're using the theory and the data to address policy, to evaluate policies. Um, now, it's still remarkable that this theory is doing as well as it is, and some of you may be skeptical. Maybe it's somehow a statistical artifact of the procedures. Uh, maybe it's a measurement error problem. Uh, but the nice thing about having all these data is you can actually go and look for the underlying mechanism. So a household runs a deficit, which is the difference between its consumption and its income, largely, that in, in an accounting sense, it must be financed by something. They're either going to get credit, run down their savings. It adds up perfectly, all, summing over all the mechanisms to the, to the deficit. And there's a natural covariance uh, specification, essentially like running the deficit onto each of the devices one at a time. The bottom table in this slide is showing you uh, that, ha that households uh, use cash quite a bit to smooth fluctuations. They do not use savings accounts very much, which is a comment on the overall state of the financial system that I will come down to. But what I really want to feature in this slide is the role of gifts as coded and observed in the data. And for some of these households, you know, gifts is a non-trivial fraction of the way that they're smoothing the deficit. And for some households, it's considerable. So it's risk sharing. You might think of that as gift, reciprocal gift giving. And indeed, that's exactly what you see in the data. Now, I'm portraying these villages as somehow, you know, these amazing aero debris economies that succeed by these full insurance benchmarks. But the picture is not so bright when we start to look at other variables. So, for example, if you look at the marginal product of capital from an estimated production function, you would see a great divergence 
Whereas, of course, if these were perfect capital markets, the uh, marginal products ought to be equated to a common interest rate, and they are not. And this picture survives adjusting for risk. I'll have more to say about that momentarily. Uh, so basically, money is not flowing from low productivity households to high productivity households, at least not enough to have overturned this picture. Now, I must tell you, you know, that one of the strange things of gathering data for 15, 16 years is that uh, you can actually see what eventually happens. And uh, households do save quite a bit, and eventually the households with very high returns are saving more, and this differential does disappear, not disappear, mitig it's mitigated, it's, it's uh, made less severe if you wait long enough. But of course, that's not a good welfare measure if households are discounting uh, the future, you know, it, it essentially is taking a long time. And uh, there would be a better way to do this, that's for money to flow from low to high productivity enterprises and largely it doesn't happen much. There are other indications of similar imperfections with investment here is uh, equations derived from theory being tested uh, and this, like the finance literature, is a test of whether the timing and extent of investment is sensitive to cash flow. And indeed, it's definitely true in the data that periods of relatively high cash flow are associated with periods of high investment. And that's controlling for future productivity, so it's not confounding high cash flow with, with productivity that ought to drive investment. It's more of a liquidity uh, distortion that's, uh, that's showing up. Um, so another dramatic way to think about, you know, what's working and what's not is to think about the capital asset pricing model applied to these villages. Now, deliberately being provocative here, you know, you may ask me, you haven't been using your microphones yet, you may ask me uh, what uh, Am I envisioning going on in a village? Are they buying and selling stocks? And the answer is no, they're not doing that. But it's as if you gave each household a project or a set of projects from which they earn returns. And then given those returns, a certain amount of transfer is either added if the returns were low or subtracted if the returns were high. So this risk sharing network that we've already documented uh, is going to be something that the households are kind of taking as given. And there's an Euler equation again for how much should be invested in each one of these projects. Uh, and if you do sort of traditional manipulation of those first order conditions, uh, you get something like the traditional capital asset pricing model. And indeed, assuming quadratic utility and so on, you can get, you know, a very familiar expression that, uh, that if you determine how much a project, a household's project is varying with the village aggregate, you get a beta uh, similar to a stock market beta and then look to see whether expected returns, uh, which is the average over the whole sample, are co-moving with those betas. So here's the point, which is uh, if uh, the risk here is the aggregate risk, it's not the idiosyncratic risk according to the model. So projects which are not, quote, so desirable are projects that have a return which uh, is high when the rest of the projects in the village have a high return. So in order to get that project to be run by the household, you have to compensate by giving a higher expected return. And <clears throat> indeed, when you look at the data, you can see that uh, expected returns, average returns, are correlated with these co-movement beta variables. Uh, I've shown these pictures to people who work on U.S. financial markets, and they find them rather uh, pleasantly, you know, stunningly good fit. 
uh, relative to what they're used to seeing. Uh, another way to sort of get at the paradox here is if you measure aggregate and idiosyncratic shocks or co-movement plus additional idiosyncratic shocks in production, the uh, idiosyncratic shocks are huge in terms of quantities. But if you looked at the risk premia, it's exactly the other way around. Namely, the risk premia is largely driven by the aggregate shocks and less so by the idiosyncratic shocks, although again, in other respects, this is a rejection because there should be no role for the idiosyncratic shocks at all. So that begs the issue. These, this work is basically testing an autarky model against a complete markets model. The truth must be sort of weighted toward the full markets model, but it does not go that far. So we need some alternative tool to try to figure out, you know, the, the middle ground. Um, and so that comes to this uh, work uh, on estimating the underlying financial regimes using uh, dynamic programming, linear programming, and maximum likelihood uh, to compute, estimate, and test various possible financial regimes. So if you think about an entrepreneur in a village, uh, they are going to start with some level of capital or some past level of debt or in mechanism design terminology, some promised utility level. Uh, and then they will use the capital plus effort to deliver output, which is stochastic. As after output is realized according to the terms of the endogenously derived contract, there will be transfers like those risk sharing transfers uh, or new levels of debt and saving. Then consumption is determined and the residual will be investment to be carried over to the following period. So it's a dynamic programming problem and the key is not only computing the value functions and the policies but doing so by embedding these various other possible constraints. At the bottom of this slide is a moral hazard constraint uh, which says in words that if Z bar is sort of the recommended level of effort of the entrepreneur and Z bar is unobserved, then that must dominate in expected utility for that entrepreneur relative to taking some alternative deviant action like Z hat. Uh, so these are written down in histograms or probabilities that turns these programs into linear programs. So at each iteration you're solving uh, fairly, fairly high dimensional linear programs and then iterating on the value function. Um, so there's a lot going on in this slide. You know, one is to say for any given regime, you estimate parameters. So you can estimate the degree of risk aversion, the degree of work aversion, estimate the mean and variance of measurement error in the data, and other parameters. Uh, for each regime, now, you know, reading down the list, could be moral hazard, could be full information, limited commitment, simple borrowing and lending, Worse yet, savings only or the worst of all is just autarky. So for each of those uh, regimes, we estimate parameters via maximum likelihood and then we can in invoke these tests of Wang to compare these non-nested financial regimes. So in the second part of the slide, uh, you would see, for example, in yellow, that full information is highlighted, meaning what? That if you use only the consumption and output data and looked at households in financial networks, as we already did, this tool reports back what we thought was true earlier, namely the full information regime is the best fitting regime. However, for these same villages, if you add another variable, namely, you know, capital levels and investment, uh, you go all the way to something like borrowing and lending or maybe savings only or savings with a credit constraint. So a much less 
well-functioning financial regime. Uh, so one message is if you are studying entrepreneurship, try to gather data on both consumption and investment because that will be key to sort of identifying uh, the ultimate financial regime. Now, we, it's not just about villages, it's about towns and communities in urban areas. So we conduct the same tests with the annual data in the urban area, and there we discover that moral hazard is the best fitting regime. And that is true even when we include the investment data. So the conclusion would be that villages aren't doing very well in the flow of funds, as I have already told you, but somehow, some way, uh, with networks or otherwise, households in the urban areas are, are doing better. So if you want to see, you know, the salient features of the data and the best fitting regime, we compare rural to urban. And again, it's this persistence of the capital stock, very slow moving levels of capital, largely staying on the 45 degree line, you know, having next year the same level of capital you have today, uh, that dictates the best fitting regime to be the savings regime in the rural data, whereas in the urban data, it's a much flatter profile and the moral hazard regime is the overall winner. Finally, a question. Yes, Bernard. Um, um, the equations went a bit fast, so I wasn't sure what kind of moral hazard you were looking at. Is it moral hazard in production or moral hazard in the um, execution of the financial contract or both? It's, it's in production. So this moral hazard constraint is saying that the effort being exerted by the entrepreneur is unobserved to the financial market or to the lender. So it's a combination of insurance, but not full insurance, because otherwise you have terrible incentives to provide high effort. It, it is true, in response to your question, making the point that questions are good to have, that we're only looking overall at the combination of all formal, informal financial contracts, rather than here focusing on individual I'll have a bit more to say about that, not as much as I would like. Okay, so back to policy. So in these rural villages, at least, the sort of, you know, credit constrained, if not savings only, financial regime is best fitting to the data. Uh, what would happen in a policy intervention? Well, here we don't have to do some counterfactual, uh, we actually see factually that <clears throat> the government of Thailand intervened by setting up a savings and loan, so-called million baht fund, in every single village in the country. This is under Prime Minister Thaksin. If you're reading the news, you'll realize the political significance of this. Uh, but uh, this work with Kowalski, you know, shows you that in the data and in the model, uh, consumption moves overall uh, almost one-to-one -one with this intervention, as if many households were hand-to-mouth consumers. However, it kind of depends on the combination of your current liquidity and whether or not you have an investment opportunity. That chasm that you're seeing there consists of households who are right on the edge of doing an investment project and, and otherwise don't until this intervention comes along and it weakens the credit constraints sufficiently that they jump into the lumpy investment opportunity and not only that, they actually lower consumption at the same time to help quote unquote co-finance. Now the advantage of having the structural model with the estimated parameters is that you can actually do counterfactuals. So Joe and I considered many other policies, including lump sum transfers. Just giving out the money, the equivalent amount of money, rather than funding the savings and loan. Now it turns out that for most households, 
the uh, lump sum would have been preferred. But for households that are right on that binding credit constraint, this is indeed, you know, an effective way to increase their welfare and well-being conditioned on the tax revenues being used to fund it. Um, so that's another message that I already delivered, which is there's a lot of heterogeneity in these villages and uh, in terms, in this case, of, of impact of policy reforms. Uh, I'm not claiming these village funds were necessarily the unique best way to spend the money. And with the model, you know, we could move on to evaluate even other policies. Now, they, despite the diagram here, which looks like some households invest and cut back on consumption, it's actually hard to see investment in the data, at least the way Joe and I did it. Uh, and there's kind of this view coming out of randomized control trials in development that uh, investment is very hard to, to find. Now, Robin did not advertise his talk as a microfinance talk, but actually he is also getting you know, non-trivial movements as he weakens the capital constraints. So with Emily Breja and, uh, and Abhijit Banerjee, we've taken the same approach, but now try to, from those estimated production functions, estimate which households in the, in the data have particularly high returns due to a technology shifter. And uh, I won't dwell on this, but suffice it to say that for those, you know, high productivity households, you do begin to see statistically significant impacts, not only on business assets, but also on business profits and, uh, and non-labor uh, non -labor inputs. Now, you know, Joe and I found the wages are going up in these villages uh, that got a higher per capita treatment. So this is consistent with that, that the, some businesses expand production, make money, hire labor, and that's putting upward, upward pressure on the, on the local wages. Just the way many models in macro with credit constraints work. Uh, now, just like not all households are alike, not all communities are alike, and in fact, one of the things we did in the initial 1997 survey was ask about leadership and resources and cooperation. Uh, it's interesting that households report uh, that their village is not very good relative to other villages in my sample. That turns out to be an amazingly good predictor of the success uh, or lack of it of this village fund intervention. So these households know something about the social aspects of their networks that are hard for researchers to uncover. Uh, but, uh, but, and this is not a path that we've pursued, but it, it is important for policy uh, to bear in mind that it's not one size fits all. Even if village funds on average are a good idea, they, they are not necessarily going to work and everywhere and maybe they need to be run at the county or provincial level uh, for the weaker communities and, and villages. Um, now, finally, I come to sort of linking villages to not just to a, an intervention, but to the larger financial system. So what this slide is showing uh, is basically, again, whether or not you're able to smooth consumption or smooth investment against adverse shocks and take advantage of good shocks depends on whether or not you're a member or client of a financial institution. Uh, so what we see in the data is kind of a weighted average people who are clients and people who are not clients onto the consumption and investment variables. Now, for the moment, if you thought the location of financial institutions were more or less random, you could use the distance from a household in a village to the branch of a financial institution as an instrument for access 
and then run these sort of instrumented uh, equations to develop a scorecard. So essentially we can now rate financial institutions in the country, at least those in my data, by their ability to help households smooth consumption and investment. Uh, it turns out that a bank for agriculture does quite well in this regard, and I know from its operating system how they're doing it, namely they don't insist on timely repayment when they can verify that a farmer is experiencing an unusually bad year in terms of the weather or a number of other possible events. They don't like to think of themselves as running an insurance system, but uh, effectively, in addition to credit, they are doing that uh, in their operating system that shows up in the data. Some of the other institutions don't fare so well. Um, so this is rating, you know, financial institutions not by stress tests, not by certain balance sheet ratios, but based on how well they're serving households and small businesses um, in this risk sharing aspect. Um, but having, you know, taken a look at the larger financial system, banks and so on, I kind of revert right back to the village to show you this picture, which is of households connected to one another via family, marriage, uh, or birth, but also the financial network, that gift-giving network that I was describing earlier. And the point here is pretty simple, but quite important, that households who seemingly do not have access to a financial institution actually have indirect access through the informal network. Uh, so if you, if you look at the regressions, it would appear that households are quite sensitive to income changes. Uh, but on the other hand, being a member of a financial institution lowers that sensitivity to idiosyncratic shocks and actually being indirectly linked to a financial institution through these financial networks is as effective as being a direct member. So the money and the risk is being intermediated at the local village level. For investment, the uh, sensitivity to cash flow doesn't go away and the mechanism seems to be different, namely having kin in the village, according to the theory, threatening you if you don't pay back loans is actually the device that seems to be helping, although not completely eliminating <clears throat> the sensitivity of investment to cash flow. And again, you ask, what are the mechanisms? You know, seeing is believing, so, uh, and by the way, I should have said this all along. I guess you figured it out. Rather than each slide telling you the list of co-authors, I've been carefully reporting on all the co-authors as I, as I show you each one of the slides without actually saying the words. This, for example, with wit uh, shows a rather sophisticated bridge loan household with a formal sector loan due may not have a good year unable to repay or at least it would be onerous. They turn around and borrow informally from family or even a money lender and uh, pay off the formal sector loan, get a new formal sector loan and use that money to pay off the bridge loan. So this there's a huge money market in these villages, a huge informal sector. And, uh, and it's, in this case, allowing the informal markets to be complements with formal financial contracts. If the formal contracts are incomplete, they're not indexed by the shocks, the informal markets seem to allow basically those contingencies to be built in when you consider both formal and informal at the same time. Now, another way that the informal markets could work well is when 
local people have more information about the credit worthiness of their fellow kin group or better information about that moral hazard and effort or uh, generally the literature on joint liability shows that it can be good to for formal lenders to use joint liability contracts so it's basically the same idea but it's important to note that when you have other kinds of information problem informal markets can be a really bad idea because you will undercut high-powered incentives uh, that the lender you know may have engineered having some contingencies in the loan contract that are going to be undercut. Uh, so which is going to win out is something we haven't figured out. And of course, in the end, there is really an issue about whether you could even try to control uh, these informal markets. But the US is trying in a very different context, because this is the same debate uh, on shadow banking that's taken place in the US especially post-financial crisis, uh, trying to control, observe, and document uh, over-the-counter exchanges, in some cases requiring that exchanges take place on a centralized market. Uh, so these sort of metaphors, if you like, that come up in the reality of dealing with an emerging market developing country are not limit, the implications are not limited to development or developing countries, they can be taken into more advanced financial markets. Um, this picture shows the spread of the Bank for Agriculture uh, and commercial banks uh, in terms of branching. These countries are in transitions. The financial system is spreading. It's not in a steady state. There are regions where there are no branches, and then in the following 10 years, one will, will pop up. Uh, this particular work is trying to figure out how the strategic interactions play out between a bank for agriculture and the for-profit commercial banking sector. Uh, so, you know, this basically is assuming brick and mortar delivery of financial products that at least currently in Thailand there's really no mobile banking the uses of computers and online banking is really still uh, minimal so if you're going to get financial services you're going to have to be connected to a bank or through an informal network with someone connected to a bank <clears throat> now it turns out that this competition uh, in the terms of where to go and what branches to open could lead to Pareto efficient outcomes. This could be the mechanism. It works well if there's exclusivity, basically. If financial institutions can compete for the rights to offer financial contracts to households and businesses. And in this ongoing work, you can actually embed all the fancy contract theory and mechanism design into hoteling type models to jointly determine the nature of the equilibrium financial contracts and the location of the branches. This is something we're currently working on. But that said, talking about financial design, uh, there's something we know called common agency. So, you know, if two or more lenders are not competing for the same client, but also providing a financial contract that's active for the same client, then that can actually lead to Nash-like inefficiencies, and the contracts will not be uh, Pareto optimal. And for that matter, with all these mechanism design going on, you'd want the household or business to commit to a long-term relationship with a particular individual bank. But if banks compete with one another and can bid away existing clients, that can undercut this gain from long-term relationships. And that, too, uh, would lead to some inefficiencies. Uh, so the real point here is not to give you 
the best answer at the moment. It's more to provide the framework to think about regulation of financial systems rather than ad hoc metrics about whether competition is good or bad, should be encouraged or discouraged. We use models uh, often calibra calibrated against the data to begin to think about optimal, optimal regulation. Um, okay, so we come back to sort of embedding these financial institutions and villages and towns into the larger system. We can use those financial accounts to actually aggregate up um, from the household level to the village level and create what are like the national income and product accounts for all the villages in my data. So we have the production account, the savings investment account, the balance of payments account, and the <coughs> flow of funds accounts. Uh, so it turns out that the use of cash and inventory is actually higher at the village aggregate level than it is within the village. So that will bring us to issues of monetary policy and so on. Um, and uh, this is just a peek at output and income and balance of payments for a couple of these villages. Here's a peek at the flow of funds. The point of this slide is you can do flow of funds analysis at the village level, looking at the use of currency and loans and trade credit coming in or going out with you know, financial and non-financial institutions outside the village, or you can aggregate up to the economy-wide level, as in this picture at the national level of the sectors in the national income accounts, including the whole country running deficits with foreigners or, or running surpluses. So again, I haven't spent enough time today to convince you, but everything I did at the village level, you can begin to aggregate up into the regional level. You can choose the aggregates that you want to analyze and conduct you know, similar analysis. Uh, these are just two examples of doing that. Uh, in one of these papers, we use the fact that villages seem to be fit best by a uh, limited borrowing regime, whereas urban communities seem to be fit best by moral hazard regime. So we build a macro model of the whole country uh, with those estimated underpinnings and got what we didn't see coming, a flow of funds result, uh, namely that both labor and capital will flow from villages to urban areas. And in turn, urban areas will have the larger share of GDP. Now, we kind of know that urban areas look like that. Uh, and urbanization plays a role for many reasons. Here we're saying one of those reasons we didn't see is the variation in the financial regimes uh, within sectors or villages urban or different regions of the country. And the other slide here is a dissertation of white basically looking at a VAR <coughs> at the national level, uh, say, you know, a SIMS-like uh, exercise to determine the impact of uh, monetary policy through interest rates and so on. And then with those residuals, those shocks, seeing what impact, you know, is at the village level with the data we have. And it turns out there's a very substantial consumption impact of a tightening of monetary policy at the national level. Now, you know, it's not like there's all this really fancy, you know, financial markets in the country. So it might be surprising when you think about the channels of monetary transmission that monetary policy is having this impact. But, uh, but there, the impact comes in other ways through remittances and migration, uh, and, it, and it's quite real. So this is something I know the IMF and various uh, inter, intranational agencies are trying to figure out. You know, it's what, how to think about macro monetary policy as 
varied across countries which differ quite a lot in their, in their financial systems. So my last slide, uh, or next to last slide other than the conclusions, is to come back to this recurrent theme which is we're using general equilibrium theory uh, and the welfare theorems. Uh, we know that those welfare theorems will hold when there are indivisibilities and private information of certain kinds. Uh, sometimes there are pecuniary externalities, uh, as in the middle column, but here ex ante optimal design of the financial markets can, can mitigate or eliminate those externalities. So that's the role in the sort of ex ante design that the theory is playing. Uh, and finally, there are the remaining instances where you need some active monetary policy to provide liquidity and so on. So, you know, I, I'm blessed to have all this data. There's even obviously many more things I haven't talked about. Um, data on the contracts, the institutions and markets all at the same time seems like we are getting closer and closer to that world with big data. Uh, having the panel is great. We're definitely combining theory and data. We're not drawing a distinction between micro versus macro versus development versus finance. It's a unified general equilibrium approach to those subfields. This work offers practical policy advice that can be, can be implemented on the ground. I've emphasized, you know, the role of geography primarily, although you can think about networks among financial players as another illustration of that metaphor. Uh, combining theory, econometrics, and computation, echoing back to my first slide honoring Gregory Chow. And, uh, and obviously this is not, I can illustrate it best by what we're doing in Thailand, but there's nothing special about Thailand. These techniques and data would allow you to do this analysis in other countries. Well, managed to get one question. Is there time for a few more? Only time for one question. I, I didn't succeed in that objective. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we will have the conference dinner tonight, and the, uh, we will have a bus, shuttle bus, to go to the conference dinner venue, and the bus will set off from here at 6 10, and the bus will be waiting for us in front of the building. So if we are walking slowly to the bus, to the front door, it is time to go down. Thank you.